This lecture is part of an online Commission of Algebra course and will be about stably free modules. So you remember that last lecture we had a long sequence of modules which are minor variations of free modules and the ones of these that were closest to free modules are the stably free modules. So a module M is stably free if M directs sum um, a finite number of copies of R to the M is free. The key point here that we, as we'll explain later, is that M has to be finite. So this is all over a ring R. And the first thing we have to do is to give an example of a module that is stably free, but not free. It's completely trivial that any free module is stably free because you can just take M equals zero. So here is a stably free module um, that is not free. And uh, the simplest one is the tangent space of a sphere S2. So we draw a sphere S2 and we take its tangent space, which means at every point we've got this little tangent plane of a sphere. Well, there's a bit of a problem with that is it's not at all clear how the tangent space of a sphere is a module over a ring. Um, well, the way you turn it into a module over a ring is as follows. We let the ring R be continuous functions on the sphere with values in the, in the real numbers. And we let the module M be the space of a continuous vector fields. So this is just a function from the sphere such that the value at each point is just a tangent vector at that point. So you can think of a, an element of M as just being some sort of vector field on the sphere. So you choose a tangent vector field at each point of the sphere and this has to vary continuously. And we notice that M is a module over the ring of continuous functions because it's a module under pointwise multiplication. Um, if you've got a continuous function with some value at a point, you can just multiply the, the tangent vector at that point by that continuous function. Um, so we've got to show, first of all, that this module is stably free. And secondly, we've got to show that it's not free. So let's first check that M is stably free. And M is stably free because M directs some R is isomorphic to R cubed. If we add one copy of the um, free module over R, we get to sum of three copies of the free module over R. And this is easy to see because M corresponds to the tangent um, bundle of S2. In other words, for each point at S2, we're assigning its tangent vector. And R is going to correspond to the normal bundle. So at each point of S2, we assign um, a vector of the normal space at that point, which is the um, vectors in R3 orthogonal to the tangent space. And you notice the normal bundle of a sphere S2 is, is actually just isomorphic to the one-dimensional free bundle where you just take um, um, S2 times a copy of the reals as a vector bundle over it. And this is because um, if you take a normal bundle over a sphere at each point, we're just signing a vector in the normal space. And you can just take a, a, a point, say, at distance one from the sphere in some metric, and that will give you a cross section of the normal bundle showing it's trivial. Um, on the other hand, if you take the sum of the tangent bundle and the normal bundle of the sphere, then to each point you're just assigning um, uh, uh, so something that's obviously isomorphic to three the, the, the standard three-dimensional space you're working in. So the sum of the tangent bundle and the normal bundle is canonically isomorphic to um, a sum of three copies of the reals. So the tangent bundle plus the normal bundle is a free vector bundle. 
Um, so that's how you do it topologically. It's kind of obvious that m plus r is isomorphic to r cubed. Um, we can also do this algebraically. So, um, so first of all, we take the ring of all continuous functions on r. Well, the ring of all continuous functions on R is a bit of a mess if you're doing it algebraically. So let's just take the ring of all polynomial functions on, on the sphere. So let's take all polynomials on um, three-dimensional space and quotient out by the polynomials vanishing on the sphere. So we get a ring which you can think of as being polynomials on S2. And now we can define a module M. So, um, so um, we're going to take this to be a submodule of, of some of three copies of R. So R3 is going to be the set of all points A, B, C. And now we don't want all points A, B, C. Here, A, B, C are in R. So this is a, you can think of this as corresponding to choosing a, for each point of the sphere, you choose a, a, a vector lying in R3, but we, we only want the ones that are tangent to um, a given point of a sphere. So um, we want AX plus BY plus CZ is equal to zero, which if you think about it a bit, corresponds to restricting to the tangent space. Um, so here M is obviously a, um, a sub um, module of R3. And you can write the decomposition of R3 as M plus R um, by mapping a point A, B, C to, well, we, we, we've got to make it into a point with this property here. So we write it as A minus X D, B minus Y D, C minus um, Z D, and the point D, so, so, so D is in R, and this is in M. And here, D is just going to be the point um, AX plus BY plus CZ. And you can easily check that this gives, um, shows that M plus R is isomorphic to R cubed. Um, so that shows that M is stably free. Um, if we want to show that M is not free, well, this follows from the hairy sphere theorem. So you remember the hairy sphere theorem says that if you take a two dimensional sphere and have a nice vector field on it at each point, then any, any continuous vector field on, R, on, on, on S2 vanishes somewhere at some point. Um, and um, this means that the tangent um, bundle can't be trivial. So the tangent bundle is, 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 is not a free bundle, because if it were a free bundle, then we could take a, 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 a section of the a free bundle that didn't vanish anywhere. Um, and so this implies that M is not a free module over, over the ring R. Um, actually, you can do this in other dimensions. And um, there's nothing particularly special about um, a two-dimensional sphere. So let's take an N minus one dimensional sphere in N dimensional um, um, real vector space. So as before, we have a module M over the ring R, which is either continuous functions or polynomial functions on the on the sphere. I don't really really care. And um, we see that M direct sum with R is isomorphic to R to the n, just as um, we did for n equals three. Um, so, so this always gives a stably free module, and we can ask when is M free? And it's free when 
n equals 1, 2, 4, or 8. So this is over S0, S1, S3, and S7. And it's fairly easy to see that it's free in these cases. So these three cases, S0, S1, and S3, are groups. They correspond to the um, elements of norm 1 inside the reals or the complex numbers or Hamiltonian quaternions. And if you've got any group, then its tangent bundle is trivial because there's a canonical way to identify the tangent space at each point with the tangent space at the origin because you can just left multiply by a group element. So the tangent space, so the tangent space is trivial or, or rather free. So um, S7 is a little bit tricky because that's not quite a group, it's a, but it's got a, um, a sort of non-associative multiplication with inverses. The key point is that the multiplication is a sort of inverse. And this, this sort of corresponds to the multiplication in the octonians or Cayley numbers. Um, and it was an open question for a long time about whether where there were any other spheres for which the tangent bundle is trivial. This is, this is the famous vector fields on a sphere problem. Can you find n linearly independent tangent vector fields on an n-dimensional sphere, or I guess n minus one dimensional sphere. Um, and this was finally solved by um, J.F. Adams, um, which says no other n work. And there seems to be no particularly easy proof of this. Um, Frank Adams's original proof was a very hard piece using higher cohomology operations and things like this. And there are now slightly simpler proofs using K-theory, but there seems to be no particularly easy proof of this. I mean, you can give easy proofs for some values of n. Um, and the hard case is when n is a power of 2. Um, so that actually seems to give an example of a, an algebraic problem for which the only known solution involves um, algebraic topology. Um, Another example when stable, um, stably free modules turn up is in Sayer's conjecture. So Sayer's conjecture, which was finally proved by Quillen and Suslin, um, was the following. He, he said, is any projective module over over a, a polynomial ring, over a field, um, free. I guess this should be a finitely generated projective module. And Sayre's motivation for this was that um, affine space kind of corresponds to um, a real vector space. And over a, uh, over a real vector space, um, one can show in algebraic topology that all finite dimensional vector bundles are trivial. Um, now, finitely generated projective modules over rings kind of correspond to vector bundles, as we will see a little bit later. So the analogous statement would be that any finitely projective module over, over the coordinate ring of affine space is free. So what does this have to do with stably free modules? Well, it turns out it's easy to show it is stably free. Um, and we can do this as follows. Um, so first of all, there's a very famous theorem of Hilbert that we may or may not get to later on in the course, which shows that if you've got a projective module, or for that matter, any module over a polynomial ring, let's call this projective module P0, then it has a finite free resolution by free modules. Um, up to Fn. Now, if this module happens to be projective, then we can split this map. So there's a map from P0 to F0 splitting it. So F0 can be written as P1 plus P0 mapping to P0. And similarly, the map from F1 to F0 um, um, maps F1 onto P1, and this also splits. So we can write F1 as P2 plus P1, and so on. And it goes all the way up to here. So um, 
we get naught goes to pn plus one. And um, all the all the free modules here, all the free modules here split. So what this means is that we now get P0 plus P1 plus P2 plus P3 plus P4 um, all the way up to um, Pn plus 1 is isomorphic to P0 plus P1 plus P2 plus P3 and so on. And all these pairs are free. So we've got P0 plus a finite rank free module is a finite rank free module. So P0 is stably free. Um, however, um, so we can get to stably free quite easily, but getting from a stably free module to a free module is really very difficult. It turns out to be really quite hard to tell the difference between stably free modules and free modules because most natural invariants you can think of for modules turn out to be much the same for stably free modules and free modules. Um, there's, a, um, there's actually an elementary way of phrasing Sayre's conjecture. So, so Sayre's conjecture can be reduced to showing that every stably free module over the polynomial ring kx1 up to xn is free. And this is the same. Um, it, this is, you can easily reduce to the case where you just add just one copy of m. So we want to show that if m plus r is isomorphic to r to the n, then this implies m is isomorphic to r to the n minus 1. Sorry, that's, I don't want this less to be the same as that one. Let me call that m. And um, if we've got an identification of m plus r with r to the m, then the um, a generator of r can be identified with the vector in r to the m. So we have a vector f1 up to fm with fi in r given by this identification. And you can easily check that f1 up to fm generate the unit ideal in r. And furthermore, um, this space is isomorphic to r to the m. Turns it's quite easy to check that this is equivalent to the fact that the vector f1 fm can be extended to an invertible matrix in um, m by m matrices over the ring R. So this is an elementary version of Sayre's conjecture that says nothing about modules or anything else. It says that if you've got um, a, a vector of m polynomials in n variables that generate the unit ideal, then you can extend it to an invertible m by m matrix. It's very easy to check this for um, um, n equals 1, um, rather harder for other n. Um, so um, we can also investigate stably free modules of small rank, in particular rank 0 or 1. So let's look at stably free modules of rank 0. Um, so what this means is that um, m plus r to the n is isomorphic to r to the n for some n. The rank is obviously going to be the difference between this number and this number, which is zero in this case. Um, so first of all, if we look at m plus r1 is isomorphic to r1, it's quite easy to show that m equals zero. More generally, if m plus n is isomorphic to r, with m and n submodules, in other words, m and n ideals, then you can immediately see that m n is equal to zero um, because it's a direct sum. And so, um, so m and n are not free if m or n 
is non-zero. So if a sum of two ideals is isomorphic to R and one of them, one of the ideals is isomorphic to R, the other one must be zero. So this implies that if M plus R is isomorphic to R, then M is isomorphic, well, M is just zero. Um, more generally, if M plus R to the N is isomorphic to R to the N, then what you can do is you can take nth exterior powers of both sides. Lambda to the N. So we recall that lambda to the N of A plus B, nth exterior power is lambda to the N of A plus lambda to the N minus one of A, tends it with lambda to the one of B and so on. So if we take the nth exterior power of R to the N, um, we just get R. And if we take the nth exterior power of this, um, we get um, R plus um, um, the next one will be M tends with R to the N and then other things we don't care about. So we've now reduced the case. We've got a module plus R is isomorphic to R. So M tensor with R to the N is isomorphic to zero. So M is isomorphic to zero. So, so the only stably free module of rank zero is just zero. Next, we can look at stably free of rank one. Um, fortunately, this turns out to be somewhat easier than the case of rank zero. So if M plus R to the N is isomorphic to R to the N plus one, then all we can do is we take N plus one exterior powers and we find here we get R because the N plus one -th exterior power of R to the N plus one is just zero. And here we take the N plus one -th exterior power of this, which is zero. And then we take the nth exterior power of this, which is R tensored with the first exterior power of M, which is just M. And then we've got various other things um, in involving the um, second exterior power of M tensored with something which we don't really care about. Um, anyway, so, so here we've got M plus something is um, isomorphic to R. Um, and now um, we can add R to the um, N to both sides. So we find something or other plus M plus R to the N is isomorphic to um, um, R to the N plus one. Um, so um, so we, we, we know that um, these two are equal by assumption here. Um, so, um, by the case of stably free modules of rank zero, we see that all this stuff here must vanish. Um, so, um, we find that this then implies that M is isomorphic to R because all this stuff here is zero. Um, so, uh, stably free modules of rank zero and one are either zero or a one-dimensional free module. Stably free modules of rank two are considerably more complicated. In fact, we saw at the beginning of this lecture that we could have a stably free module of rank two that wasn't free. Okay, next lecture, I'll be saying a little bit more about stably free modules and in particular, introducing the Eilenberg-McLean swindle in order to study them a little bit more.